Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev was a Soviet politician who served as the last leader of the Soviet Union from 1985 to the country's dissolution in 1991. He served as General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union from 1985 and additionally as Head of State beginning in 1988, as Chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet from 1988 to 1989. Chairman of the Supreme Soviet from 1989 to 1990 and the only President of the Soviet Union from 1990 to 1991. Ideologically, Gorbachev initially adhered to Marxism-Leninism but moved towards social democracy by the early 1990s. Gorbachev was born in Privalnoye, Russian SFSR, to a poor peasant family of Russian and Ukrainian heritage. Growing up under the rule of Joseph Stalin, in his youth he operated combined harvesters on a collective farm before joining the Communist Party, which then governed the Soviet Union as a one-party state. Studying at Moscow State University, he married fellow student Raisa Titarenko in 1953 and received his law degree in 1955. Moving to Stavropol, he worked for the Komsomol Youth Organization and, after Stalin's death, became a keen proponent of the de-Stalinization reforms of Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. He was appointed the first party secretary of the Stavropol Regional Committee in 1970, overseeing construction of the Great Stavropol Canal. In 1978, he returned to Moscow to become a secretary of the party's Central Committee, and in 1979 joined its governing Politburo. Three years after the death of Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev following the brief tenures of Yuri Andropov and Konstantin Chernenko in 1985 the Politburo elected Gorbachev as general secretary, the de facto leader. Although committed to preserving the Soviet state and its Marxist-Leninist ideals, Gorbachev believed significant reform to be necessary for survival. He withdrew troops from the Soviet-Afghan war and embarked on summits with United States President Ronald Reagan to limit nuclear weapons and end the Cold War. Domestically, his policy of glasnost allowed for enhanced freedom of speech and press, while his perestroika sought to decentralize economic decision-making to improve its efficiency. His democratization measures and formation of the elected Congress of People's Deputies undermined the one-party state. Gorbachev declined to intervene militarily when various Eastern Bloc countries abandoned Marxist-Leninist governance in 1989-1992. Internally, growing nationalist sentiment threatened to break up the Soviet Union, leading Marxist-Leninist hardliners to launch the unsuccessful August coup against Gorbachev in 1991. In the coup's wake, the Soviet Union dissolved against Gorbachev's wishes. After resigning the presidency, he launched the Gorbachev Foundation, became a vocal critic of Russian presidents Boris Yeltsin and Vladimir Putin, and campaigned for Russia's social democratic movement. Gorbachev is considered to be one of the most significant figures of the second half of the 20th century. The recipient of a wide range of awards, including the Nobel Peace Prize, he is praised for his role in ending the Cold War introducing new political and economic freedoms in the Soviet Union, and tolerating both the fall of Marxist-Leninist administrations in Eastern and Central Europe and the reunification of Germany. In Russia he is often derided for facilitating the dissolution of the Soviet Union an event which weakened Russia's global influence and precipitated an economic collapse in Russia and associated states. Early Life and Education 1931-1950, Childhood Gorbachev was born on March 2, 1931 in the village of Privalnoye, then in the North Caucasus Krai of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, Soviet Union. At the time, Privalnoye was divided almost evenly between ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians. Gorbachev's paternal family were ethnic Russians and had moved to the region from Voronezh several generations before, his maternal family were of ethnic Ukrainian heritage and had migrated from Chernihivy. His parents named him Victor at birth, but at the insistence of his mother a devout Orthodox Christian he had a secret baptism, 
where his grandfather christened him Mikhail. His relationship with his father, Sergei Andreyevich Gorbachev, was close, his mother, Maria Pantelyevna Gorbacheva, was colder and punitive. His parents were poor, and lived as peasants. They had married as teenagers in 1928, and in keeping with local tradition had initially resided in Sergei's father's house, an adobe walled hut, before a hut of their own could be built. The Soviet Union was a one-party state governed by the Communist Party, and during Gorbachev's childhood was under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. Stalin had initiated a project of mass rural collectivization which, in keeping with his Marxist-Leninist ideas, he believed would help convert the country into a socialist society. Gorbachev's maternal grandfather joined the Communist Party and helped form the village's first call cause in 1929, becoming its chair. This farm was 19 kilometers outside Privalnoye village and when he was three years old, Gorbachev left his parental home and moved into the call cause with his maternal grandparents. The country was then experiencing the famine of 1930 1933, in which two of Gorbachev's paternal uncles and an aunt died. This was followed by the Great Purge, in which individuals accused of being enemies of the people, including those sympathetic to rival interpretations of Marxism like Trotskyism, were arrested and interned in labor camps if not executed. Both of Gorbachev's grandfathers were arrested and spent time in Gulag labor camps before being released. After his December 1938 release, Gorbachev's maternal grandfather discussed having been tortured by the secret police, an account that influenced the young boy. Following on from the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, in June 1941 the German army invaded the Soviet Union. German forces occupied Privalnoye for four and a half months in 1942. Gorbachev's father had joined the Red Army and fought on the front lines, he was wrongly declared dead during the conflict and fought in the Battle of Kursk before returning to his family, injured. After Germany was defeated, Gorbachev's parents had their second son, Alexander, in 1947, he and Mikhail would be their only children. The village school was closed during much of the war but reopened in autumn 1944. Gorbachev did not want to return but when he did he excelled academically. He read voraciously, moving from the Western novels of Thomas Main Reed to the works of Vissarion Belinsky, Alexander Pushkin, Nikolai Gogol, and Mikhail Lermontov. In 1946, he joined the Komsomol the Soviet political youth organization, becoming leader of his local group and then being elected to the Komsomol Committee for the district. From primary school he moved to the high school in Molotovskoy, he stayed there during the week while walking the 19 kilometers home during weekends. As well as being a member of the school's drama society, he organized sporting and social activities and led the school's morning exercise class. Over the course of five consecutive summers from 1946 onward he returned home to assist his father in operating a combine harvester, during which they sometimes worked 20-hour days. In 1948, they harvested over 8,000 centners of grain, a feat for which Sergi was awarded the Order of Lenin and his son the Order of the Red Banner of Labor. 1950-1955, University in June 1950, Gorbachev became a candidate member of the Communist Party. He also applied to study at the law school of Moscow State University, then the most prestigious university in the country. They accepted him without asking for an exam, likely because of his worker-peasant origins and his possession of the Order of the Red Banner of Labor. His choice of law was unusual. It was not a well-regarded subject in Soviet society at that time. Aged 19, he traveled by train to Moscow, the first time he had left his home region. In Moscow, Gorbachev resided with fellow MSU students at a dormitory in the Sokolniki district. He and other rural students felt at odds with their Muscovite counterparts but he soon came to fit in. Fellow students recall him working especially hard, 
often late into the night. He gained a reputation as a mediator during disputes, and was also known for being outspoken in class, although he would reveal some of his views only privately, for instance, he confided in some students his opposition to the Soviet jurisprudential norm that a confession proved guilt, noting that confessions could have been forced. During his studies, an anti-Semitic campaign spread through the Soviet Union, culminating in the doctor's plot, Gorbachev publicly defended Vladia Lieberman, a Jewish student who was accused of disloyalty to the country by one of his fellows. At MSU, Gorbachev became the Komsomol head of his entering class, and then Komsomol's deputy secretary for agitation and propaganda at the law school. One of his first Komsomol assignments in Moscow was to monitor the election polling in Prisninsky district to ensure the government's desire for near total turnout. Gorbachev found that most of those who voted did so out of fear. In 1952, he was appointed a full member of the Communist Party. As a party and Komsomol member, he was tasked with monitoring fellow students for potential subversion, some of his fellow students said that he did so only minimally and that they trusted him to keep confidential information secret from the authorities. Gorbachev became close friends with Zedenk Mlyna with acute a Czechoslovak student who later became a primary ideologist of the 1968 Prague Spring. Mlyna with acute recalled that the duo remained committed Marxist-Leninists despite their growing concerns about the Stalinist system. After Stalin died in March 1953, Gorbachev and Mlyna with acute joined the crowds massing to see Stalin's body lying in state. At MSU, Gorbachev met Reza Tidarenko who was studying in the university's philosophy department. She was engaged to another man but after that engagement fell apart, she began a relationship with Gorbachev, together they went to bookstores, museums, and art exhibits. In early 1953, he took an internship at the procurator's office in Molotovskoy district, but was angered by the incompetence and arrogance of those working there. That summer, he returned to Privalnoye to work with his father on the harvest, the money earned allowed him to pay for a wedding. On September 25, 1953 he and Reza registered their marriage at Sakalniki Registry Office, and in October moved in together at the Lenin Hills Dormitory. Reza discovered that she was pregnant and although the couple wanted to keep the child she fell ill and required a life-saving abortion. In June 1955, Gorbachev graduated with a distinction, his final paper had been on the advantages of socialist democracy over bourgeois democracy. He was subsequently assigned to the Soviet procurator's office, which was then focusing on the rehabilitation of the innocent victims of Stalin's purges, but found that they had no work for him. He was then offered a place on an MSU graduate course specializing in Kalkaz law, but declined. He had wanted to remain in Moscow, where Reza was enrolled in a Ph.D. program, but instead gained employment in Stavropol, Reza abandoned her studies to join him there. Early CPSU Career 1955-1969, Stavropol Komsomol In August 1955, Gorbachev started work at the Stavropol Regional Procurator's Office, but disliked the job and used his contacts to get a transfer to work for Komsomol, becoming deputy director of Komsomol's agitation and propaganda department for that region. In this position, he visited villages in the area and tried to improve the lives of their inhabitants, he established a discussion circle in Gorkiabaka village to help its peasant residents gain social contacts. Mikhail Gorbachev and his wife Reza initially rented a small room in Stavropol taking daily evening walks around the city and on weekends hiking in the countryside. In January 1957, Reza gave birth to a daughter, Irina, and in 1958 they moved into two rooms in a communal apartment. In 1961, Gorbachev pursued a second degree, in agricultural production, he took a correspondence course from the local Stavropol Agricultural Institute receiving his diploma in 1967. His wife had also pursued a second degree, 
attaining a Ph.D. in sociology in 1967 from the Moscow State Pedagogical University, while in Stavropol she too joined the Communist Party. Stalin was ultimately succeeded as Soviet leader by Nikita Khrushchev, who denounced Stalin and his cult of personality in a speech given in February 1956, after which he launched a de-Stalinization process throughout Soviet society. Later biographer William Taubman suggested that Gorbachev embodied the reformist spirit of the Khrushchev era. Gorbachev was among those who saw themselves as genuine Marxists or genuine Leninists in contrast to what they regarded as the perversions of Stalin. He helped spread Khrushchev's anti-Stalinist message in Stavropol, but encountered many who continued to regard Stalin as a hero or who praised the Stalinist purges as just. Gorbachev rose steadily through the ranks of the local administration. The authorities regarded him as politically reliable, and he would flatter his superiors, for instance gaining favor with prominent local politician Fyodor Kulakov. With an ability to outman over rivals, some colleagues resented his success. In September 1956, he was promoted first secretary of the Stavropol city's Komsomol, placing him in charge of it. In April 1958 he was made deputy head of the Komsomol for the entire region. At this point he was given better accommodation, a two-room flat with its own private kitchen, toilet and bathroom. In Stavropol, he formed a discussion club for youths and helped mobilize local young people to take part in Khrushchev's agricultural and development campaigns. In March 1961, Gorbachev became first secretary of the regional Komsomol, in which position he went out of his way to appoint women as city and district leaders. In 1961, Gorbachev played host to the Italian delegation for the World Youth Festival in Moscow, that October. He also attended the 22nd Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. In January 1963, Gorbachev was promoted to personnel chief for the regional party's agricultural committee, and in September 1966 became first secretary of the Stavropol City Party organization. By 1968 he was increasingly frustrated with his job in large part because Khrushchev's reforms were stalling or being reversed and he contemplated leaving politics to work in academia. However, in August 1968, he was named second secretary of the Stavropol Kraycom, making him the deputy of first secretary Leonid Yefremov and the second most senior figure in the Stavropol region. In 1969, he was elected as a deputy to the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union and made a member of its Standing Commission for the Protection of the Environment. Cleared for travel to Eastern Bloc countries, in 1966 he was part of a delegation which visited East Germany, and in 1969 and 1974 visited Bulgaria. In August 1968, the Soviet Union led an invasion of Czechoslovakia to put an end to the Prague Spring a period of political liberalization in the Marxist-Leninist country. Although Gorbachev later stated that he had had private concerns about the invasion, he publicly supported it. In September 1969 he was part of a Soviet delegation sent to Czechoslovakia, where he found the Czechoslovak people largely unwelcoming to them. That year, the Soviet authorities ordered him to punish Fajim B. Sadikov a philosophy professor of the Stavropol Agricultural Institute whose ideas were regarded as critical of Soviet agricultural policy, Gorbachev ensured that Sadikov was fired from teaching but ignored calls for him to face tougher punishment. Gorbachev later related that he was deeply affected by the incident, my conscience tormented me for overseeing Sadikov's persecution. 1970-1977 heading the Stavropol region. In April 1970, Yefremov was promoted to a higher position in Moscow and Gorbachev succeeded him as the first secretary of the Stavropol Kraycom. This granted Gorbachev significant power over the Stavropol region. He had been personally vetted for the position by senior Kremlin leaders and was informed of their decision by the Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev. Aged 39, 
he was considerably younger than his predecessors in the position. As head of the Stavropol region, he automatically became a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1971. According to biographer Zors Medvedev, Gorbachev had now joined the party's super elite. As regional leader, Gorbachev initially attributed economic and other failures to the inefficiency and incompetence of cotters, flaws in management structure or gaps in legislation, but eventually concluded that they were caused by an excessive centralization of decision-making in Moscow. He began reading translations of restricted texts by Western Marxist authors such as Antonio Gramsci, Louis Aragon, Roger Garotti, and Giuseppe Baffa, and came under their influence. Gorbachev's main task as regional leader was to raise agricultural production levels, a task hampered by severe droughts in 1975 and 1976. He oversaw the expansion of irrigation systems through construction of the Great Stavropol Canal. For overseeing a record grain harvest in Ipatovsky district, in March 1972 he was awarded the Order of the October Revolution by Brezhnev in a Moscow ceremony. Gorbachev always sought to maintain Brezhnev's trust, as regional leader, he repeatedly praised Brezhnev in his speeches, for instance referring to him as the outstanding statesman of our time. Gorbachev and his wife holidayed in Moscow, Leningrad, Uzbekistan, and resorts in the North Caucasus, he holidayed with the head of the KGB, Yuri Andropov, who was favorable towards him and who became an important patron. Gorbachev also developed good relationships with senior figures including the Soviet Prime Minister, Alexei Kosygin, and the long-standing senior party member Mikhail Sislov. The government considered Gorbachev sufficiently reliable that he was sent as part of Soviet delegations to Western Europe. He made five trips there between 1970 and 1977. In September 1971 he was part of a delegation that traveled to Italy where they met with representatives of the Italian Communist Party, Gorbachev loved Italian culture but was struck by the poverty and inequality he saw in the country. In 1972, he visited Belgium and the Netherlands, and in 1973 West Germany. Gorbachev and his wife visited France in 1976 and 1977, on the latter occasion touring the country with a guide from the French Communist Party. He was surprised by how openly West Europeans offered their opinions and criticized their political leaders, something absent from the Soviet Union, where most people did not feel safe speaking so openly. He later related that for him and his wife, these visits shook our a priori belief in the superiority of socialist over bourgeois democracy. Gorbachev had remained close to his parents, after his father became terminally ill in 1974. Gorbachev traveled to be with him in Privalno shortly before his death. His daughter, Irina, married fellow student Anatoly Vergensky in April 1978. In 1977, the Supreme Soviet appointed Gorbachev to chair the Standing Commission on Youth Affairs due to his experience with mobilizing young people in Komsomol. Secretary of the Central Committee of CPSU in November 1978, Gorbachev was appointed a secretary of the Central Committee. His appointment had been approved unanimously by the Central Committee's members. To fill this position, Gorbachev and his wife moved to Moscow, where they were initially given an old dacha outside the city. They then moved to another, at Soznovka, before finally being allocated a newly built brick house. He was also given an apartment inside the city, but gave that to his daughter and son-in-law, Irina had begun work at Moscow's Second Medical Institute. As part of the Moscow political elite, Gorbachev and his wife now had access to better medical care and to specialized shops, they were also given cooks, servants, bodyguards, and secretaries, although many of these were spies for the KGB. In his new position, Gorbachev often worked 12 to 16 hour days. He and his wife socialized little, but liked to visit Moscow's theaters and museums. In 1978, 
Gorbachev was appointed to the Central Committee's Secretariat for Agriculture, replacing his old friend Kulakov, who had died of a heart attack. Gorbachev concentrated his attentions on agriculture, the harvests of 1979, 1980 and 1981 were all poor, due largely to weather conditions, and the country had to import increasing quantities of grain. He had growing concerns about the country's agricultural management system, coming to regard it as overly centralized and requiring more bottom-up decision-making, he raised these points at his first speech at a Central Committee plenum, given in July 1978. He began to have concerns about other policies too. In December 1979, the Soviets sent the armed forces into neighboring Afghanistan to support its Soviet-aligned government against Islamist insurgents, Gorbachev privately thought it a mistake. At times he openly supported the government position, in October 1980 he for instance endorsed Soviet calls for Poland's Marxist-Leninist government to crack down on growing internal dissent in that country. That same month, he was promoted from a candidate member to a full member of the Politburo, the highest decision-making authority in the Communist Party. At the time, he was the Politburo's youngest member. After Brezhnev's death in November 1982, Andropov succeeded him as General Secretary of the Communist Party, the de facto leader in the Soviet Union. Gorbachev was enthusiastic about the appointment. However, Although Gorbachev hoped that Andropov would introduce liberalizing reforms, the latter carried out only personnel shifts rather than structural change. Gorbachev became Andropov's closest ally in the Politburo, with Andropov's encouragement, Gorbachev sometimes chaired Politburo meetings. Andropov encouraged Gorbachev to expand into policy areas other than agriculture, preparing him for future higher office. In April 1983, Gorbachev delivered the annual speech marking the birthday of the Soviet founder Vladimir Lenin, this required him rereading many of Lenin's later writings, in which the latter had called for reform in the context of the new economic policy of the 1920s, and encouraged Gorbachev's own conviction that reform was needed. In May 1983, Gorbachev was sent to Canada where he met Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau and spoke to the Canadian Parliament. There, he met and befriended the Soviet ambassador, Alexander Yakovlev, who later became a key political ally in February 1984, Andropov died, on his deathbed he indicated his desire that Gorbachev succeed him. Many in the Central Committee nevertheless thought the 53-year-old Gorbachev was too young and inexperienced. Instead. Konstantin Chernenko a long-standing Brezhnev ally was appointed general secretary, but he too was in very poor health. Chernenko was often too sick to chair Politburo meetings, with Gorbachev stepping in last minute. Gorbachev continued to cultivate allies both in the Kremlin and beyond, and also gave the main speech at a conference on Soviet ideology where he angered party hardliners by implying that the country required reform. In April 1984, Gorbachev was appointed chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Soviet legislature, a largely honorific position. In June he traveled to Italy as a Soviet representative for the funeral of Italian Communist Party leader Enrico Berlinguer, and in September to Sofia. Bulgaria to attend celebrations of the 40th anniversary of its liberation from the Nazis by the Red Army. In December, he visited Britain at the request of its Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, she was aware that he was a potential reformer and wanted to meet him. At the end of the visit, Thatcher said, I like Mr. Gorbachev. We can do business together. He felt that the visit helped to erode Andrei Gromyko's dominance of Soviet foreign policy while at the same time sending a signal to the United States government that he wanted to improve Soviet U.S. relations. General Secretary of the CPSU On March 10, 1985, Chernenko died. Gromyko proposed Gorbachev as the next General Secretary, as a long-standing party member 
Gromyko's recommendation carried great weight among the Central Committee. Gorbachev expected much opposition to his nomination as General Secretary, but ultimately the rest of the Politburo supported him. Shortly after Chernenko's death, the Politburo unanimously elected Gorbachev as his successor, they wanted him rather than another elderly leader. He thus became the eighth leader of the Soviet Union. Few in the government imagined that he would be as radical a reformer as he proved. Although not a well-known figure to the Soviet public, there was widespread relief that the new leader was not elderly and ailing. Gorbachev's first public appearance as leader was at Chernenko's Red Square funeral, held on March 14. Two months after being elected, he left Moscow for the first time, traveling to Leningrad, where he spoke to assembled crowds. In June he traveled to Ukraine, in July to Belarus, and in September to Tumen Oblast, urging party members in these areas to take more responsibility for fixing local problems. 1985-1986, Early Years Gorbachev's leadership style differed from that of his predecessors. He would stop to talk to civilians on the street, forbade the display of his portrait at the 1985 Red Square holiday celebrations, and encouraged frank and open discussions at Politburo meetings. To the West, Gorbachev was seen as a more moderate and less threatening Soviet leader, some Western commentators however believed this an act to lull Western governments into a false sense of security. His wife was his closest advisor, and took on the unofficial role of a first lady by appearing with him on foreign trips, her public visibility was a breach of standard practice and generated resentment. His other close aides were Georgi Shuknazarov and Anatoly Chernyev. Gorbachev was aware that the Politburo could remove him from office, and that he could not pursue more radical reform without a majority of supporters in the Politburo. He sought to remove several older members from the Politburo, encouraging Grigory Romanov, Nikolai Tikhanov, and Viktor Grishin into retirement. He promoted Gromyko to head of state, a largely ceremonial role with little influence, and moved his own ally, Eduard Shevardnadze, to Gromyko's former post in charge of foreign policy. Other allies whom he saw promoted were Yakovlev, Anatoly Lukyanov, and Vadim Medvedev. Another of those promoted by Gorbachev was Boris Yeltsin, who was made a secretary of the Central Committee in July 1985. Most of these appointees were from a new generation of well-educated officials who had been frustrated during the Brezhnev era. In his first year, 14 of the 23 heads of department in the secretariat were replaced. Doing so, Gorbachev secured dominance in the Politburo within a year, faster than either Stalin, Khrushchev or Brezhnev had achieved. Domestic Policies Foreign Policy 1987-1989, Further Reforms Domestic Reforms Forming the Congress of People's Deputies Relations with China and Western States Nationality Question and the Eastern Bloc Unraveling of the USSR In the revolutions of 1989, most of the Marxist-Leninist states of Central and Eastern Europe held multi-party elections resulting in regime change. In most countries, like Poland and Hungary, this was achieved peacefully, but in Romania, the revolution turned violent, and led to Soskoe's overthrow and execution. Gorbachev was too preoccupied with domestic problems to pay much attention to these events. He believed that democratic elections would not lead Eastern European countries into abandoning their commitment to socialism. In 1989, he visited East Germany for the 40th anniversary of its founding. Shortly after, in November, the East German government allowed its citizens to cross the Berlin Wall, a decision Gorbachev praised. Over the following years, much of the wall was demolished. Neither Gorbachev nor Thatcher or Mitterrand wanted a swift reunification of Germany, aware that it would likely become the dominant European power. Gorbachev wanted a gradual process of German integration but Kohl began calling for rapid reunification. 
With German reunification in 1990, many observers declared the Cold War over. 1990-1991, Presidency of the Soviet Union In February 1990, both Liberalisers and Marxist-Leninist hardliners intensified their attacks on Gorbachev. A liberalizer march took place in Moscow criticizing Communist Party rule, while at a Central Committee meeting, the hardliner Vladimir Brovikov accused Gorbachev of reducing the country to anarchy and ruin and of pursuing Western approval at the expense of the Soviet Union and the Marxist-Leninist cause. Gorbachev was aware that the Central Committee could still oust him as General Secretary, and so decided to reformulate the role of head of government to a presidency from which he could not be removed. He decided that the presidential election should be held by the Congress of People's Deputies. He chose this over a public vote because he thought the latter would escalate tensions and feared that he might lose it. A spring 1990 poll nevertheless still showed him as the most popular politician in the country. In March, the Congress of People's Deputies held the first Soviet presidential election, in which Gorbachev was the only candidate. He secured 1,329 in favor to 495 against. 313 votes were invalid or absent. He therefore became the first executive president of the Soviet Union. A new 18-member presidential council de facto replaced the Politburo. At the same Congress meeting, he presented the idea of repealing Article 6 of the Soviet Constitution, which had ratified the Communist Party as the ruling party of the Soviet Union. The Congress passed the reform undermining the de jure nature of the one-party state. In the 1990 elections for the Russian Supreme Soviet, the Communist Party faced challengers from an alliance of liberalists known as Democratic Russia, the latter did particularly well in urban centers. Yeltsin was elected the parliament's chair, something Gorbachev was unhappy about. That year, Opinion polls showed Yeltsin overtaking Gorbachev as the most popular politician in the Soviet Union. Gorbachev struggled to understand Yeltsin's growing popularity, commenting, He drinks like a fish, he's inarticulate, he comes up with the devil knows what, he's like a worn-out record. The Russian Supreme Soviet was now out of Gorbachev's control, in June 1990, it declared that in the Russian Republic, its laws took precedence over those of the Soviet central government. Amid a growth in Russian nationalist sentiment, Gorbachev had reluctantly allowed the formation of a communist party of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic as a branch of the larger Soviet Communist Party. Gorbachev attended its first congress in June, but soon found it dominated by hardliners who opposed his reformist stance. German Reunification and the Gulf War August Putsch and Government Crises Final Collapse On August 29, 1991, the Supreme Soviet indefinitely suspended all Communist Party activity, effectively ending Communist rule in the Soviet Union. From then on, the Soviet Union collapsed with dramatic speed. By the end of September, Gorbachev had lost the ability to influence events outside of Moscow. On October 30, Gorbachev attended a conference in Madrid trying to revive the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. The event was CO-sponsored by the U.S. and Soviet Union, one of the first examples of such cooperation between the two countries. There, he again met with Bush. En route home, he traveled to France where he stayed with Mitterrand at the latter's home near Bayonne. After the coup, Yeltsin had suspended all Communist Party activities on Russian soil by shutting down the Central Committee offices in Storaya Square along with raising of the Imperial Russian tricolor flag alongside the Soviet flag at Red Square. By the final weeks of 1991, Yeltsin began to take over the remnants of the Soviet government including the Kremlin itself. To keep unity within the country, Gorbachev continued to pursue plans for a new union treaty but found increasing opposition to the idea of a continued federal state as the leaders of various Soviet republics bowed to growing nationalist pressure. 
Yeltsin stated that he would veto any idea of a unified state, instead favoring a confederation with little central authority. Only the leaders of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan supported Gorbachev's approach. The referendum in Ukraine on December 1 with a 90% turnout for secession from the Union was a fatal blow, Gorbachev had expected Ukrainians to reject independence. Without Gorbachev's knowledge, Yeltsin met with Ukrainian President Leonid Kravchuk and Belarusian President Stanislav Shushkevich in Belovea Forest, near Brest, Belarus, on December 8 and signed the Belavaza Accords, which declared the Soviet Union had ceased to exist and formed the Commonwealth of Independent States as its successor. Gorbachev only learned of this development when Shushkevich phoned him. Gorbachev was furious. He desperately looked for an opportunity to preserve the Soviet Union, hoping in vain that the media and intelligentsia might rally against the idea of its dissolution. Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Russian Supreme Soviets then ratified the establishment of the CIS. On December 9, he issued a statement calling the CIS agreement illegal and dangerous. On December 20, the leaders of 11 of the 12 remaining republics all except Georgia met in Alma-Ata and signed the Alma-Ata Protocol, agreeing to dismantle the Soviet Union and formally establish the CIS. They also provisionally accepted Gorbachev's resignation as president of what remained of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev revealed that he would resign as soon as he saw that the CIS was a reality. Accepting the fait accompli of the Soviet Union's dissolution, Gorbachev reached a deal with Yeltsin that called for Gorbachev to formally announce his resignation as Soviet President and Commander-in-Chief on December 25, before vacating the Kremlin by December 29. Yakovlev, Chernyiv, and Shevardnadze joined Gorbachev to help him write a resignation speech. Gorbachev then gave his speech in the Kremlin in front of television cameras, allowing for international broadcast. In it. He announced, I hereby discontinue my activities at the post of President of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. He expressed regret for the breakup of the Soviet Union but cited what he saw as the achievements of his administration, political and religious freedom, the end of totalitarianism, the introduction of democracy and a market economy, and an end to the arms race and Cold War. Gorbachev was the third out of eight Soviet leaders, after Malenkov and Khrushchev, not to die in office. The following day, December 26, the Soviet of the Republics, the upper house of the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union, formally voted the Soviet Union out of existence. The Soviet Union officially ceased to exist at midnight on December 31, 1991, as of that date. All Soviet institutions that had not been taken over by Russia ceased to function. Post-Presidential Life 1991-1999, Initial Years Out of office, Gorbachev had more time to spend with his wife and family. He and Reza initially lived in their dilapidated dacha on Rublevsko Shoss, and were also allowed to privatize their smaller apartment on Kosygin Street. He focused on establishing his International Foundation for Socio-Economic and Political Studies, or Gorbachev Foundation, launched in March 1992, Yakovlev and Rivenko were its first vice presidents. Its initial tasks were in analyzing and publishing material on the history of perestroika, as well as defending the policy from what it called slander and falsifications. The foundation also tasked itself with monitoring and critiquing life in post-Soviet Russia, presenting alternative development forms to those pursued by Yeltsin. To finance his foundation, Gorbachev began lecturing internationally, charging large fees to do so. On a visit to Japan, he was well received and given multiple honorary degrees. In 1992, he toured the U.S. in a Forbes private jet to raise money for his foundation. During the trip he met up with the Reagans for a social visit. From there he went to Spain, where he attended the Expo 92 World Fair in Seville and met with Prime Minister Felipe González, who had become a friend of his. 
he further visited Israel and Germany, where he was received warmly by many politicians who praised his role in facilitating German reunification. To supplement his lecture fees and book sales, Gorbachev appeared in commercials such as a television advertisement for Pizza Hut, another for the OBB and photograph advertisements for Apple Computer and Louis Vuitton, enabling him to keep the foundation afloat. With his wife's assistance, Gorbachev worked on his memoirs, which were published in Russian in 1995 and in English the following year. He also began writing a monthly syndicated column for the New York Times. In 1993, Gorbachev launched Green Cross International, which focused on encouraging sustainable futures, and then the World Political Forum. In 1995, he initiated the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates. Gorbachev had promised to refrain from criticizing Yeltsin while the latter pursued democratic reforms, but soon the two men were publicly criticizing each other again. After Yeltsin's decision to lift price caps generated massive inflation and plunged many Russians into poverty, Gorbachev openly criticized him, comparing the reform to Stalin's policy of forced collectivization. After pro-Yeltsin parties did poorly in the 1993 legislative election, Gorbachev called on him to resign. In 1995, his foundation held a conference on the intelligentsia and perestroika. It was there that Gorbachev proposed to the Duma a law that would reduce many of the presidential powers established by Yeltsin's 1993 constitution. Gorbachev continued to defend perestroika but acknowledged that he had made tactical errors as Soviet leader. While he still believed that Russia was undergoing a process of democratization, he concluded that it would take decades rather than years, as he had previously thought. In contrast to her husband's political activities, Raisa had focused on campaigning for children's charities. In 1997, she founded a subdivision of the Gorbachev Foundation known as Raisa Maximovna's Club to focus on improving women's welfare in Russia. The foundation had initially been housed in the former Social Science Institute building, but Yeltsin introduced limits to the number of rooms it could use there. The American philanthropist Ted Turner then donated over $1 million to enable the foundation to build new premises on the Leningradsky Prospect. In 1999, Gorbachev made his first visit to Australia, where he gave a speech to the country's parliament. Shortly after, in July, Raisa was diagnosed with leukemia. With the assistance of German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, she was transferred to a cancer center in Munster, Germany, and there underwent chemotherapy. In September she fell into a coma and died. After Raisa's passing, Gorbachev's daughter Irina and his two granddaughters moved into his Moscow home to live with him. When questioned by journalists, he said that he would never remarry. 1996 Presidential Campaign 1999-2008, Promoting Social Democracy in Putin's Russia In December 1999, Yeltsin resigned and was succeeded by his deputy, Vladimir Putin, who then won the March 2000 presidential election. Gorbachev attended Putin's inauguration ceremony in May, the first time he had entered the Kremlin since 1991. Gorbachev initially welcomed Putin's rise, seeing him as an anti-Yeltsin figure. Although he spoke out against some of the Putin government's actions, Gorbachev also had praise for the new government, in 2002, he said. I've been in the same skin. That's what allows me to say that what has done is in the interest of the majority. At the time, he believed Putin to be a committed Democrat who nevertheless had to use a certain dose of authoritarianism to stabilize the economy and rebuild the state after the Yeltsin era. At Putin's request, Gorbachev became CO chair of the Petersburg Dialogue project between high-ranking Russians and Germans. In 2000, Gorbachev helped form the Russian United Social Democratic Party. In June 2002, he participated in a meeting with Putin, who praised the venture, 
suggesting that a center-left party could be good for Russia and that he would be open to working with it. In 2003, Gorbachev's party merged with the Social Democratic Party to form the Social Democratic Party of Russia which, however, faced much internal division and failed to gain traction with voters. Gorbachev resigned as party leader in May 2004 following a disagreement with the party's chairman over the direction taken in the 2003 election campaign. The party was later banned in 2007 by the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation due to its failure to establish local offices with at least 500 members in the majority of Russian regions which is required by Russian law for a political organization to be listed as a party. Later that year, Gorbachev founded a new movement, the Union of Social Democrats. Stating that it would not contest the forthcoming elections, Gorbachev declared, We are fighting for power, but only for power over people's minds. Gorbachev was critical of U.S. hostility to Putin, arguing that the U.S. government doesn't want Russia to rise again as a global power and wants to continue as the sole superpower in charge of the world. More broadly, Gorbachev was critical of U.S. policy following the Cold War, arguing that the West had attempted to turn into some kind of backwater. He rejected the idea expressed by Bush that the U.S. had won the Cold War, arguing that both sides had cooperated to end the conflict. He declared that since the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S., rather than cooperating with Russia, had conspired to build a new empire headed by themselves. He was critical of how the U.S. had expanded NATO right up to Russia's borders despite their initial assurances that they would not do so, citing this as evidence that the U.S. government could not be trusted. He spoke out against the 1999 NATO bombing of Yugoslavia because it lacked UN backing, as well as the 2003 invasion of Iraq led by the US. In June 2004, Gorbachev nevertheless attended Reagan's state funeral, and in 2007 visited New Orleans to see the damage caused by Hurricane Katrina. 2008-2022 growing criticism of Putin and foreign policy remarks. Barred by the Constitution from serving more than two consecutive terms as president, Putin stood down in 2008 and was succeeded by his chosen successor, Dmitry Medvedev, who reached out to Gorbachev in ways that Putin had not. In September 2008, Gorbachev and business oligarch Alexander Lebedev announced they would form the Independent Democratic Party of Russia, and in May 2009 Gorbachev announced that the launch was imminent. After the outbreak of the Russo-Georgian War between Russia and South Ossetian separatists on one side and Georgia on the other, Gorbachev spoke out against U.S. support for Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili and for moving to bring the Caucasus into the sphere of its national interest. Gorbachev nevertheless remained critical of Russia's government and criticized the 2011 parliamentary elections as being rigged in favor of the governing party, United Russia, and called for them to be re-held. After protests broke out in Moscow over the election, Gorbachev praised the protesters. In 2009, Gorbachev released Songs for Rasa, an album of Russian romantic ballads, sung by him and accompanied by musician Andrei Makarevuk, to raise money for a charity devoted to his late wife. That year, he also met with U.S. President Barack Obama in efforts to reset strained U.S. Russian relations, and attended an event in Berlin commemorating the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. In 2011, an 80th birthday gala for him was held at London's Royal Albert Hall, featuring tributes from Shimon Paris, Lech Walesa, Michel Rockard, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Proceeds from the event went to the Reza Gorbachev Foundation. That year, Medvedev awarded him the Order of St. Andrew the Apostle the first called. After Putin announced his intention to run for president in the 2012 election, Gorbachev was opposed to the idea. He complained that Putin's new measures had tightened the screws on Russia and that the president was trying to completely subordinate society, 
adding that United Russia now embodied the worst bureaucratic features of the Soviet Communist Party. In 2015, Gorbachev ceased his frequent international traveling. He continued to speak out on issues affecting Russia and the world. In 2014, he defended the Crimean status referendum and Russia's annexation of Crimea that began the Russo-Ukrainian War. In his judgment, while Crimea was transferred from Russia to Ukraine in 1954, when both were part of the Soviet Union, the Crimean people had not been asked at the time, whereas in the 2014 referendum they had. After sanctions were placed on Russia as a result of the annexation, Gorbachev spoke out against them. His comments led to Ukraine banning him from entering the country for five years. At a November 2014 event marking 25 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, Gorbachev warned that the ongoing war in Donbass had brought the world to the brink of a new Cold War, and he accused Western powers, particularly the US, of adopting an attitude of triumphalism towards Russia. In December 2014, he said that both sides in the war in Donbass have been violating the terms of the ceasefire, both sides are guilty of using dangerous types of weapons and violating human rights, adding that Minsk agreements form the basis for the settlement of the conflict. In 2016, he said that politicians who think that problems and disputes can be solved by using military force even as a last resort should be rejected by society, they should clear the political stage. In July 2016, Gorbachev criticized NATO for deploying more troops to Eastern Europe amid escalating tensions between the military alliance and Russia. In June 2018, he welcomed the Russia-United States summit in Helsinki between Putin and U.S. President Donald Trump, although in October criticized Trump's threat to withdraw from the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, saying the move is not the work of a great mind. He added, all agreements aimed at nuclear disarmament and the limitation of nuclear weapons must be preserved, for the sake of life on Earth. Following the death of former President George H. W. Bush in 2018, a critical partner and friend of his time in office, Gorbachev stated that the work they had both accomplished led directly to the end of the Cold War and the nuclear arms race and that he deeply appreciated the attention, kindness, and simplicity typical of George, Barbara and their large, friendly family. After the January 6 United States Capitol attack, Gorbachev declared, the storming of the Capitol was clearly planned in advance, and it's obvious by whom. He did not clarify to whom he was referring. Gorbachev also stated that the attack called into question the future fate of the United States as a nation. In an interview with Russian news agency TASS on January 20, 2021, Gorbachev said that relations between the United States and Russia are of great concern, and called on U.S. President Joe Biden to begin talks with the Kremlin to make the two countries' intentions and actions clearer and in order to normalize relations. On December 24, 2021, Gorbachev said that the United States grew arrogant and self-confident after the collapse of the Soviet Union, resulting in a new empire. Hence the idea of NATO expansion. He also endorsed the upcoming security talks between the United States and Russia, saying, I hope there will be a result. 2022 Russian Invasion of Ukraine Gorbachev made no personal comment publicly on the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine. Although, on February 26, his Gorbachev Foundation stated that we affirm the need for an early cessation of hostilities and immediate start of peace negotiations. There is nothing more precious in the world than human lives. At the end of July 2022, Gorbachev's close friend, journalist Alexei Venediktov, said that Gorbachev was very upset when he found out that Putin had launched an invasion of Ukraine. According to Venediktov, Gorbachev believed that Putin destroyed his life's work. Gorbachev's interpreter, Pavel Polozchenko, 
also stated that Gorbachev was psychologically traumatized by the Russia-Ukraine conflict before his death. Political Ideology According to his university friend Zedenk Mlyna with Acute, in the early 1950s Gorbachev, like everyone else at the time, was a Stalinist. Mlyna with Acute noted, however, that unlike most other Soviet students, Gorbachev did not view Marxism simply as a collection of axioms to be committed to memory. Biographers Doder and Branson related that after Stalin's death, Gorbachev's ideology would never be doctrinal again, but noted that he remained a true believer in the Soviet system. Doder and Branson noted that at the 27th Party Congress in 1986, Gorbachev was seen to be an orthodox Marxist-Leninist, that year. The biographer Zors Medvedev stated that Gorbachev is neither a liberal nor a bold reformist. By the mid 1980s, when Gorbachev took power, many analysts were arguing that the Soviet Union was declining to the status of a third world country. In this context, Gorbachev argued that the Communist Party had to adapt and engage in creative thinking much as Lenin had creatively interpreted and adapted the writings of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels to the situation of early 20th century Russia. For instance, he thought that rhetoric about global revolution and overthrowing the bourgeoisie which had been integral to Leninist politics had become too dangerous in an era where nuclear warfare could obliterate humanity. He began to move away from the Marxist-Leninist belief in class struggle as the engine of political change, instead viewing politics as a ways of co-ordinating the interests of all classes. However, as Gooding noted, the changes that Gorbachev proposed were expressed wholly within the terms of Marxist-Leninist ideology. According to Doder and Branson, Gorbachev also wanted to dismantle the hierarchical military society at home and abandon the grand style costly, imperialism abroad. However, Jonathan Steele argued that Gorbachev failed to appreciate why the Baltic nations wanted independence and at heart he was, and remains, a Russian imperialist. Gooding thought that Gorbachev was committed to democracy, something marking him out as different from his predecessors. Gooding also suggested that when in power, Gorbachev came to see socialism not as a place on the path to communism, but a destination in itself. Gorbachev's political outlook was shaped by the 23 years he served as a party official in Stavropol. Doder and Branson thought that throughout most of his political career prior to becoming general secretary, his publicly expressed views almost certainly reflected a politician's understanding of what should be said, rather than his personal philosophy. Otherwise he could not have survived politically. Like many Russians, Gorbachev sometimes thought of the Soviet Union as being largely synonymous with Russia and in various speeches described it as Russia, in one incident he had to correct himself after calling the USSR Russia while giving a speech in Kiev. Macaulay noted that perestroika was an elusive concept, one which evolved and eventually meant something radically different over time. Macaulay stated that the concept originally referred to radical reform of the economic and political system as part of Gorbachev's attempt to motivate the labor force and make management more effective. It was only after initial measures to achieve this proved unsuccessful that Gorbachev began to consider market mechanisms and cooperatives, albeit with the state sector remaining dominant. The political scientist John Gooding suggested that had the perestroika reforms succeeded, the Soviet Union would have exchanged totalitarian controls for milder authoritarian ones although not become democratic in the Western sense. With perestroika, Gorbachev had wanted to improve the existing Marxist-Leninist system but ultimately ended up destroying it. In this, he brought an end to state socialism in the Soviet Union and paved the way for a transition to liberal democracy. Taubman nevertheless thought Gorbachev remained a socialist. He described Gorbachev as a true believer not in the Soviet system as it functioned in 1985 but in its potential to live up to what he deemed its original ideals. He added that until the end, Gorbachev reiterated his belief in socialism, insisting that it wasn't worthy of the name unless it was truly democratic. As Soviet leader, 
Gorbachev believed in incremental reform rather than a radical transformation, he later referred to this as a revolution by evolutionary means. Doder and Branson noted that over the course of the 1980s, his thought underwent a radical evolution. Taubman noted that by 1989 or 1990, Gorbachev had transformed into a social democrat. Macaulay suggested that by at least June 1991 Gorbachev was a post-Leninist, having liberated himself from Marxism-Leninism. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the newly formed Communist Party of the Russian Federation would have nothing to do with him. However, in 2006, he expressed his continued belief in Lenin's ideas, I trusted him then and I still do. He claimed that the essence of Lenin was a desire to develop the living creative activity of the masses. Taubman believed that Gorbachev identified with Lenin on a psychological level. Personal Life By 1955, his hair was thinning, and by the late 1960s he was bald, revealing a distinctive port wine stain on the top of his head. Gorbachev reached an adult height of 5 foot 9 inches. Throughout the 1960s, he struggled against obesity and dieted to control the problem, Doder and Branson characterized him as stocky but not fat. He spoke in a southern Russian accent, and was known to sing both folk and pop songs. Throughout his life, he tried to dress fashionably. Having an aversion to hard liquor, he drank sparingly and did not smoke. He was protective of his private life and avoided inviting people to his home. Gorbachev cherished his wife, who in turn was protective of him. He was an involved parent and grandparent. He sent his daughter, his only child, to a local school in Stavropol rather than to a school set aside for the children of party elites. Unlike many of his contemporaries in the Soviet administration, he was not a womanizer and was known for treating women respectfully. Gorbachev was baptized Russian Orthodox and when he was growing up, his grandparents had been practicing Christians. In 2008, there was some press speculation that he was a practicing Christian after he visited the tomb of St. Francis of Assisi, to which he publicly clarified that he was an atheist. Since studying at university, Gorbachev considered himself an intellectual. Doder and Branson thought that his intellectualism was slightly self-conscious, noting that unlike most Russian intelligentsia, Gorbachev was not closely connected to the world of science, culture, the arts, or education. When living in Stavropol, he and his wife collected hundreds of books. Among his favorite authors were Arthur Miller, Dostoevsky, and Chinggis Aitmatov, while he also enjoyed reading detective fiction. He enjoyed going for walks, having a love of natural environments, and was also a fan of association football. He favored small gatherings where the assembled discussed topics like art and philosophy rather than the large, alcohol-fueled parties common among Soviet officials. Personality Gorbachev's university friend, MLYNA with acute, described him as loyal and personally honest. He was self-confident, polite, and tactful, he had a happy and optimistic temperament. He used self-deprecating humor, and sometimes profanities, and often referred to himself in the third person. He was a skilled manager, and had a good memory. A hard worker or workaholic, as general secretary, he would rise at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning and not go to bed until 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock. He commuted from the western suburbs between 9 and 10 in the morning and returned home around 8 in the evening. Taubman called him a remarkably decent man, he thought Gorbachev to have high moral standards. Zors Medvedev thought him a talented orator, in 1986 stating that Gorbachev is probably the best speaker there has been in the top party echelons since Leon Trotsky. Medvedev also considered Gorbachev a charismatic leader, something Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chernenko had not been. Doder and Branson called him a charmer capable of intellectually seducing doubters, always trying to co-op them, or at least blunt the edge of their criticism. 
Macaulay thought Gorbachev displayed great tactical skill in maneuvering successfully between hardline Marxist-Leninists and Liberalists for most of his time as leader, adding, though, that he was much more skilled at tactical, short-term policy than strategic, long-term thinking, in part because he was given to making policy on the hoof. Doder and Branson thought Gorbachev a Russian to the core intensely patriotic as only people living in the border regions can be. Taubman also noted that the former Soviet leader has a sense of self-importance and self-righteousness as well as a need for attention and admiration which grated on some of his colleagues. He was sensitive to personal criticism and easily took offense. Colleagues were often frustrated that he would leave tasks unfinished, and sometimes also felt underappreciated and discarded by him. Biographers Doder and Branson thought that Gorbachev was a Puritan with a proclivity for order in his personal life. Taubman noted that he was capable of blowing up for calculated effect. He also thought that by 1990, when his domestic popularity was waning, Gorbachev had become psychologically dependent on being lionized abroad, a trait for which he was criticized in the Soviet Union. Macaulay was of the view that one of his weaknesses was an inability to foresee the consequences of his actions. Death Gorbachev died at the Central Clinical Hospital in Moscow on August 30, 2022, at the age of 91. He died after a severe and prolonged illness, according to the hospital. Preceding deterioration of health For a number of years before his death, Gorbachev suffered from severe diabetes and underwent several surgeries and hospital stays. In April 2011, Gorbachev underwent complex spinal surgery in Germany, at the Munich Klinik Schon Klinik München Harl Aching. On October 22, 2013, it became known that Gorbachev was undergoing a scheduled examination in a German clinic. He was also hospitalized in the Central Clinical Hospital for Oral Surgery on October 9, 2014. Gorbachev was briefly hospitalized in May 2015 as well. In November 2016, Gorbachev had a pacemaker installed at the Moscow Central Clinical Hospital. Also in 2016, he underwent surgery to replace his lenses due to cataracts. The length of his hospital visits increased in 2019, with Gorbachev hospitalized in December with pneumonia. At the beginning of 2020, Gorbachev was placed under the continuous supervision of doctors. Gorbachev's condition deteriorated even further in July 2022 as he developed kidney problems, which led to him being transferred for hemodialysis. Shortly before his death, Gorbachev underwent four more operations, lost 40 kilograms of weight, and could no longer walk. In interviews given shortly before his death, Gorbachev had complained about health and appetite problems. Gorbachev was receiving palliative care, but was allowed to leave the hospital for short periods of time. On August 29, 2022, Gorbachev arrived at the Central Clinical Hospital for another hemodialysis, where he died on August 30 at approximately 10 p.m. Moscow time. Funeral and Burial A funeral for Gorbachev was held on September 3, 2022 from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. in the Column Hall of the House of Unions. The ceremony had an element of a state funeral in the form of an honor guard, but an official state funeral was not held. The service included rites administered by a Russian Orthodox priest. Russian President Vladimir Putin bid an official farewell to Gorbachev on September 1, 2022 during a visit to the Central Clinical Hospital, where he laid flowers at his coffin. His press secretary Dmitry Peskov said that the tight schedule of the president would not allow him to be present at the funeral, as he was scheduled to visit Kaliningrad. Gorbachev was buried on the same day at Moscow's Novodevichy Cemetery, in the same grave as his wife Raisa, as requested by his will. Reactions 
Russia's President Vladimir Putin expressed his condolences on the death of Gorbachev and paid tribute to him at the Moscow hospital where the ex-president had died but, according to spokesman Dmitry Peskov, had no time to attend his funeral due to a busy work schedule. President Putin also sent a telegram to Gorbachev's family, calling him a politician and statesman who had a huge impact on the course of world history. Gorbachev's close friend Alexei Venediktov said that Gorbachev was upset that Putin had destroyed all his political reforms. State Duma deputy Vitaly Milonov was less positive in his outlook of Gorbachev, saying that Gorbachev was worse than Hitler for Russia. In addition, Russia's Communist Party leader Gennady Zhuganov said that Gorbachev was a leader whose rule brought absolute sadness, misfortune, and problems for all the peoples of our country. Nana Yeltsina, widow of former Russian President Boris Yeltsin, said that Gorbachev sincerely wanted to change the Soviet system and transform the USSR into a free and peaceful state. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen paid tribute to him on Twitter as did the UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson, former US Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Ireland's Dowsiak Michael Martin. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said Gorbachev was a one-of-a-kind statesman who changed the course of history in a towering global leader, committed multilateralist and tireless advocate for peace as former U.S. Secretary of State James Baker III stated that history will remember Mikhail Gorbachev as a giant who steered his great nation towards democracy in the context of the Cold War's conclusion. Queen Elizabeth II in her condolence stated that through his courage and vision, he gained the admiration, affection and respect of the British people. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said he helped bring an end to the Cold War embraced reforms in the Soviet Union, and reduced the threat of nuclear weapons. He leaves behind an important legacy, while former Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney said that he was a very pleasant man to deal with and history will remember him as a transformational leader. French President Emmanuel Macron called Gorbachev a man of peace whose choices opened up a path of liberty for Russians. U.S. President Joe Biden called Gorbachev a man of remarkable vision. Polish Foreign Minister Zbigniew Ross stated that Gorbachev had increased the scope of freedom of the enslaved peoples of the Soviet Union in an unprecedented way, giving them hope for a more dignified life. Foreign Minister of Lithuania Gabrieliusz Landsbergis said that, because of the infamous 1991 January events, Lithuanians will not glorify Gorbachev. We will never forget the simple fact that his army murdered civilians to prolong his regime's occupation of our country. His soldiers fired on our unarmed protesters and crushed them under his tanks. That is how we will remember him. The 14th Dalai Lama wrote to the Gorbachev Foundation to express his condolences to his daughter, Irina Verganskia, and members of his family, his friends and supporters. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said Gorbachev had left behind great as a world leader supporting the abolishment of nuclear weapons. Germany's former Chancellor Angela Merkel, who grew up in East Germany, said he completely changed her life and the world while current German Chancellor Olaf Scholz hailed Gorbachev's role in reuniting Germany. Reception and Legacy Opinions on Gorbachev are deeply divided. According to a 2017 survey carried out by the independent institute Levada Center, 46% of Russian citizens have a negative opinion towards Gorbachev, 30% are indifferent, while only 15% have a positive opinion. Many, particularly in Western countries, see him as the greatest statesman of the second half of the 20th century. U.S. press referred to the presence of Gorbimania in Western countries during the late 1980s and early 1990s, as represented by large crowds that turned out to greet his visits, with time naming him its man of the decade in the 1980s. In the Soviet Union itself, opinion polls indicated that Gorbachev was the most popular politician from 1985 through to late 1989. For his domestic supporters, 
Gorbachev was seen as a reformer trying to modernize the Soviet Union, and to build a form of democratic socialism. Taubman characterized Gorbachev as a visionary who changed his country and the world though neither as much as he wished. Taubman regarded Gorbachev as being exceptional, as a Russian ruler and a world statesman, highlighting that he avoided the traditional, authoritarian, anti-Western norm of both predecessors like Brezhnev and successors like Putin. Macaulay thought that in allowing the Soviet Union to move away from Marxism-Leninism, Gorbachev gave the Soviet people something precious, the right to think and manage their lives for themselves, with all the uncertainty and risk that that entailed. Gorbachev's negotiations with the U.S. helped bring an end to the Cold War and reduced the threat of nuclear conflict. His decision to allow the Eastern Bloc to break apart prevented significant bloodshed in Central and Eastern Europe, as Taubman noted. This meant that the Soviet Empire ended in a far more peaceful manner than the British Empire several decades before. Similarly, under Gorbachev, the Soviet Union broke apart without falling into civil war, as happened during the breakup of Yugoslavia at the same time. Macaulay noted that in facilitating the merger of East and West Germany, Gorbachev was a CO father of German unification assuring him long-term popularity among the German people. He remains a controversial figure in former Soviet-occupied countries such as the Baltic states, Ukraine, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and Poland, having apparently greenlit violent repressions against the local populations who sought independence. Locals consider Western veneration of the man an injustice and have said they do not understand the praise. He also faced domestic criticism during his rule. During his career, Gorbachev attracted the admiration of some colleagues, but others came to hate him. Across society more broadly, his inability to reverse the decline in the Soviet economy brought discontent. Liberals thought he lacked the radicalism to really break from Marxism-Leninism and establish a free market liberal democracy. Conversely, many of his Communist Party critics thought his reforms were reckless and threatened the survival of Soviet socialism, some believed he should have followed the example of China's Communist Party and restricted himself to economic rather than governmental reforms. Many Russians saw his emphasis on persuasion rather than force as a sign of weakness. For much of the Communist Party nomenclatura, the Soviet Union's dissolution was disastrous as it resulted in their loss of power. In Russia, he is widely despised for his role in the collapse of the Soviet Union and the ensuing economic collapse in the 1990s. General Veronikov one of those who orchestrated the 1991 coup attempt against Gorbachev, for instance called him a renegade and traitor to your own people. Many of his critics attacked him for allowing the Marxist-Leninist governments across Eastern Europe to fall, and for allowing a reunited Germany to join NATO, something they deemed to be contrary to Russia's national interest. The historian Mark Galeotti stressed the connection between Gorbachev and his predecessor, Andropov. In Galeotti's view, Andropov was the godfather of the Gorbachev Revolution, because as a former head of the KGB he was able to put forward the case for reform without having his loyalty to the Soviet cause questioned, an approach that Gorbachev was able to build on and follow through with. According to Macaulay, Gorbachev set reforms in motion without understanding where they could lead. Never in his worst nightmare could he have imagined that perestroika would lead to the destruction of the Soviet Union. According to the New York Times, few leaders in the 20th century, indeed in any century, have had such a profound effect on their time. In little more than six tumultuous years, Mr. Gorbachev lifted the Iron Curtain, decisively altering the political climate of the world. Awards and Honors In 1988, India awarded Gorbachev the Indira Gandhi Prize for Peace, Disarmament and Development. In 1990, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize for his leading role in the peace process which today characterizes important parts of the international community. Out of office he continued to receive honors. In 1992, 
he was the first recipient of the Ronald Reagan Freedom Award, and in 1994 was given the Grahamir Award by the University of Louisville, Kentucky. In 1995, he was awarded the Grand Cross of the Order of Liberty by Portuguese President Mario Soares, and in 1998 the Freedom Award from the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. In 2000, he was presented with the Golden Plate Award of the American Academy of Achievement at an awards ceremony at Hampton Court Palace near London. In 2002, Gorbachev received the Freedom of the City of Dublin from Dublin City Council. In 2002, Gorbachev was awarded the Charles V Prize by the European Academy of Yusti Foundation. Gorbachev, together with Bill Clinton and Sophia Loren, were awarded the 2004 Grammy Award for Best Spoken Word Album for Children for their recording of Sergei Prokofiev's 1936 Peter and the Wolf for Pentatone. In 2005, Gorbachev was awarded the Point Alpha Prize for his role in supporting German reunification. Bibliography In Popular Culture In 2020-2021, The Theatre of Nations in Moscow in collaboration with Latvian director Alvis Hermanis, staged a production called Gorbachev. Yevgeny Moranov and Cholpan Kamatova played the roles of Gorbachev and his wife Raisa respectively. It was a play focusing on their personal relationship. See also April 9th Tragedy Soviet Crackdown on Georgian Protests in 1989 Black January Soviet Crackdown on Azerbaijani Protests in 1990 Jal Toksan Soviet Economic Blockade of Lithuania Soviet OMON Assaults on Lithuanian Border Posts January Events The Barricades Transnistria War Index of Soviet Union-related articles Khomeini's Letter to Mikhail Gorbachev List of international trips made by Mikhail Gorbachev List of peace activists List of Nobel Peace Prize laureates Explanatory Notes References <laughs>